the Robin Report CEO series. I'm S.P. Raj, Chair of the Marketing Department <coughs> and Direct the Snyder Center for Innovation and Professor of Marketing at the Whitman School of Management at Syracuse University and proud partner of the Robin Report for this exciting forum. Today, we have Robin Lewis, founder and CEO of his namesake brand, The Robin Report, and Gary Friedman, CEO of RH. Gary is a true visionary who has totally recreated the original restoration hardware brand to the RH reflection of home life, indoors and out. If you have ever been in an RH gallery, you know that you're not in your grandmother's home store anymore. <laughs> we'll let these two industry experts dig into how to make a retail experience magical and memorable. We'll have a Q&A later, so please submit your questions in the chat box at the bottom of your screen. Robin, it's all yours. Okay, thanks Raj uh, for your very kind introduction. And Gary, uh, once again, I'm really looking forward to, to have this time with you. Uh, you know, last time I saw you and we talked, or you talked all the way back to New York from Columbus, I was in your private jet. I'll never forget that conversation. Uh, anyway, <laughs> I learned so much from you. Anyway, so, uh, and uh, this talk between us is going to be great. Um, and it's, it's, it's about your favorite pastime in life, the whole ecosystem of the brand RH. And it is not just about stores, quote unquote. So Gary, we got a, we're going to run a minute and a half video clip. Uh, obviously, because the picture is worth a thousand words, I couldn't describe it. And which our audience should view as just a taste of a much larger holistic vision uh, Gary has of a lifestyle that, that Gary's just beginning to create and build out. And we'll hear more about that. So um uh, yeah pictures worth a thousand words how would any of us be able to describe what we are watching how about an experience like no other or i don't know getting all romantic or magical moments you know the lighting the design and the journey through what are now being referred to as galleries not stores uh, have all been created to communicate luxury, elegance, and a good life. It's, it's actually a brilliant example of using space and transforming it into an experience that really inspires upgrading uh, your life. So this particular video clip shows both New York and Napa Valley galleries, okay? Both have a similar experience but they are custom created. In essence, they're localized for the different regions they are in. And essentially, Gary and RH, uh, RH is a terrific example of localization where the store reflects its community customers and their lifestyles. I don't know, I, not to get all romantic, but words like um, dreamy and romantic do come to mind. The combination of hospitality with interiors to inspire customers to put themselves kind of front and center, almost as stars in their own movies. I mean, <laughs> am I exaggerating? I don't think so, as you can see for yourself. So <clears throat> the video does communicate the DNA of the Irish brand and how Gary, you have transformed stores into galleries. And yes, this is just the genesis just the beginning that reflects a much larger vision for the brand, which Gary, you laid out in your recent shareholders letter and which I heard on your private jet, which I was one of the first to hear about this. And we're gonna come back to this and you're gonna take us through it. But, but before we do, let's go back to day one when you took the helm in 2001. RH was founded in 1979 as Restoration Hardware and you got the image there, it's incredible. <laughs> Is this even remotely connected to the video you just saw? 
And the beginning of RH was described, this beginning was described by Pan Danz Danziger. She's a writer of ours. She wrote an article. She described the original restoration hardware as a quirky a do it yourself fixers catalog for people restoring Victorian houses. <laughs> so anyway, Gary, in your recent uh, shareholder letter, you said, the first two decades saw us evolve from a nearly bankrupt business with a $20 million market cap and a box of Oxidol laundry detergent on the cover of its catalog to the leading luxury home brand in the world with a <coughs> market cap uh, approaching $10 billion. I would say that's a pretty incredible story. So Gary, kind of give us a brief explanation of what your initial thoughts were in those early days that, that, that would eventually trigger the creation of your big world vision. Whoops, let me, let me just turn this off. Hold on, my phone okay. just went on. Um, <laughs> uh, so so, so my, my early thoughts, well, first let's start. One, one thank you for having me, Robin and, and, and Raj, and uh, you know, hi everybody, I can't see you on screen, but uh, you know, I'm, I'm gonna assume there's people watching this. Uh, oh, you're, you're but, <laughs> But but uh, yeah, first first start this with uh, this was kind of a story of uh, you know heartbreak. I had spent uh, 14 years of my career at William Sonoma. I was there from I think when I joined the company 200 million to two billion. Um, you know I used to uh, I worked for a, a guy that I you know really respected Howard Lester, uh, mm -hmm. who was the kind of chairman and CEO. And uh, Howard used to always tell me, "Kid, no one's going to be the CEO but you." Um, you know, wow. you've made me you made me a wealthy man, and then one day he hired somebody 25 years older than me to, to be the CEO, and it, it broke my heart. So, uh. um, you know, I'm I'm someone who's is kind of, uh, you know, I, I love what I do. I, I I've never, yeah, I've never worked for money in my life, uh, uh, but uh, uh, you know, I I just knew that there was a, a a bond that was broken, and you know, level trust was broken, and restoration hardware was. Uh, people were, you know, waiting for it to go bankrupt. Um, you know, it was in the you know home furnishings category, so we were aware of it. In fact, it was a business we had al almost bought two years before, mm. uh, and um, uh, you know, we, so we had taken a look at it and we were familiar with it. Uh, uh, and so, you know, I, I called Steve Gordon and said, "Look, uh, this is what happened. You know, um, I, I don't know if I'm going to take a couple years off uh, my." Uh, you know, my wife was about was pregnant with twins and we were building a house or uh, maybe I'd come over there and help you turn the brand around. And he said, look, uh, you know, we've decided you now I'm going to step down as CEO and, um, uh, you know, we'd love to have you. But the banks have a gun to our head. We're on the edge of bankruptcy. You know, can you raise any money? And I said, I don't know. I never raised money before, but let me make a few phone calls and called a few friends, wound up. Uh, we, we wound up investing $15 million into a company that had a $20 million market cap. Uh, uh, I put roughly $5 million of my own money uh, in, the, in, in the deal. Uh, and that was, at the time, almost everything I had. Um, and everybody told me, uh, don't try to catch a falling knife. You know, when I told Howard what I was going to do, he said, you know, look at the balance sheet. It can't be done. You're going to go bankrupt. This is crazy. <laughs> You know, you're walking away from fifty million dollars in stock options, um, and uh, you know, and I, and I uh, you know, I had an epiphany uh, after I had that conversation with Howard when he was telling me, you know, you're going to walk away from fifty million of stock, fifty million dollars of stock options. This is nuts. I, you know, excused myself from dinner with him, and I, you know, was driving home, and I was going down Chestnut Street in San Francisco, where we had opened the first Pottery Barn Design Studio store and one of the first William Sonoma Grand Cuisine stores. And, you know, my career was flashing through my eyes and, and then I, I had a stop at a stoplight um, and there was kind of this low fog in San Francisco that night. And I looked up and I saw this billboard and it was one of the old Citibank billboards where they had kind of typewriter quotes. And it says, he who dies with the most toys is still dead. Uh, and I thought to myself, I thought to myself at that moment, it's not about the money. I've never worked for money in my life. Uh, and, uh, you know, I've worked for my truth and, you know, and my truth at that point was heartbroken. So. Yeah, you know, we. I had always thought that there was an opportunity um, for a kind of premium home brand in in the space, and I was, 
Uh, you know, I had a strategy at Williams Sonoma. I articulated as a tic tac toe strategy that we were going to dominate the three major market segments uh, and the three channels of distribution. And the market segments mean the premium market, the uh, upscale market, and the value market. And so, uh, you know, Williams Sonoma was kind of our premium brand, uh, Pottery Barn, kind of our upscale brand. And I was, I had spent three years of my life developing a concept called West Elm and it launched kind of, oh, yeah. uh, you know, six, six months after I left. And so, um, and, and then we are gonna, gonna try to dominate stores, uh, catalogs in the web, right? And, you know, if you can dominate all three, tic-tac-toe, you'd own the home. It was called, you know, kind of the own, own the home strategy, very simple. Um, so uh, I'd always want to take William Sonoma out of the kitchen and create, a, you know, a premium home brand with it. Mm -hmm. You know, Howard used to tell me, you know, kid, that's, you know, he called me kid when he hired me when I was 29 and he called me kid when I was still 43. So I knew there was a pro <laughs> perception problem. But uh, he said, kid, you know, uh, you can't take that brand out of the kitchen. You know, it's a kitchen brand. And so I was never able to do that. And that's why we almost uh, tried to purchase Restoration Hardware because I thought even though it was it was an unsuccessful concept, uh, we could use the real estate and um, you know and, and kind of some of the some of the stores and transform it, put it on our platform. So I, I kind of went in knowing directionally um, what I wanted to do, uh, but you know I tell you, you you know you never really know until you get going. You know a lot of people have you know said to me, oh, you've got such a great vision. Look at these galleries. Look at this. How did you see all that? And I'd, I'd say, you know, you, you know, you can sit around on the sidelines and try to imagine anything and everything you want. And, um, and it's all kind of interesting, but it's not relevant till you get going. And, you know, we like to say inside RH that, that we, we just have to be directionally right. And if we're directionally right and we get going, our learning curve goes like that. You know, mm. once you once you begin begin doing, then thinking, you, you start learning at a rapid pace and you keep evolving. So, great. Um, yeah, yeah. So 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 we we um, you know we I just got going and uh, you know almost went bankrupt multiple times. You know, the first three years I had to raise money three times. Uh, and in in two thousand and one, it was a very difficult time to raise money. Uh, so I thought, like God, maybe Howard and everybody is right. Maybe you know maybe this is too hard to do and. Uh, uh, but but I'd say you know one one of the one of the things I was lucky uh, about was um, and you know I kind of say I'm I'm looking for a few good people that d don't know what can't be done and I was you know I was one of those people I you know I was I was naive enough not to know what couldn't be done I didn't have hmm. I wasn't a victim of my own history yet and you know and sometimes I think about I think about it today Robin and I and I say if I knew what I knew today hmm. would I have taken that role at RH, would I have invested basically all the money I had left and would I have taken that risk? And I, and I actually think I, I might not have. And so, you know, there's, there's something about experience that I'd say to the students that, you know, there's, there's ex experiences, everything about the past and it's, it's not a lot about the future, right? And, and the future is about vision. And I, we always say, we try to say, you know, don't be victims of our own history, and uh, uh, and the ideas of the future don't exist in the past, uh, but the but the clues do, and some of the ideas do, you know, so some of the dots, uh, you know, exist, um, and so so you know, like I, I really think about it, I would have probably said no, that's too big a risk, you shouldn't do it. Yet it's been the the greatest ride of my life. Mm -hmm. And I've learned so much and uh, I've evolved, you know, evolved so much. And I don't think that would have happened to me in a safer place. You know, if I would have stayed at Williams Sonoma, would I have been successful? I believe I would have, you know, I was successful when I was there. Um, but there, there's something about um, venturing into the unknown. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think that, you know, that humans, you know, we, we really don't know what we can't do. And so, you know, I, I'd say to the students, you know, look, uh, don't be afraid to jump in the deep end. Uh, you you want to learn quickly, uh, take on the biggest challenges uh, and the biggest risks you can. And, and when you think that you can't figure it out, there's always another, another move. There's wow. always another. We, we almost went bankrupt here at least a dozen times 
in the first 10 years, we, we managed this company on the edge of bankruptcy. We had to dig it out of the grave. And, and so, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, a lot of life is about the struggle. You know, that's when you really learn. Uh, you know, when, when you have to kind of, you know, you know, you know, fight for what you believe in. And, uh, um, you know, and, and that, that's, that's when I've learned the most. And, uh, and I know our organization and our culture and the people that were here throughout that journey would say they, they wouldn't change anything, even though it was maybe the, the, the hardest work and the most difficult problems they've ever tried to solve in their lives. You know, Gary, you should be um, a professor in everybody's classroom. I mean, <laughs> you're talking about the human, con and you know, the, the, the philosophical thought process is just incredible. Um, and I remember one thing you said, I think I wrote about, you said, when, 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 RH was in trouble and you were going through that period, you said, look, we are going to invest 100%. If, if we're going to die, we're going to die big. <laughs> yeah. I, I said, if we're going to go song. down, we're going to go down but with it, style. It, we'll exactly, let them, exactly. Yeah. Well, let, 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 you know, let them remember us, you know, yeah. so, uh, yeah. yeah. So, so here you are today without a box of Oxidol <laughs> anywhere, <laughs> anywhere, having totally transformed the brand, right? Which you are now beginning to build out to achieve really a grand world vision, I call it, an RH branded ecosystem, if you will, which you describe in the same recent shareholders letter as your four pillars. So Gary, take us through, uh, you know, what you call your immersive and multidimensional uh, vision and where you currently are in building it. Sure, sure. Um, so maybe maybe before i start with the the what let me start with the why why okay. why are we doing it why, why are we doing it and I'll, I'll get into you know the 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 what of what yeah. the ecosystem is so uh the way we think about our our brand uh yeah. is 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 we we like to say you know what what is the core of what we do what is the the one thing that we have to you know you know, do so well that that no matter what it gives us a chance of succeeding and that that is we we sell product right if we start with that that's the only place we generate revenues and and we've architected a company um that is uh a, you know what we call a product leadership model where the product is at the center of everything we do uh, not the customer you know a lot of people talk about being a customer centric company mm. today and and i think that's that might be mm. a good strategy if you're if you're selling toothpaste and commodities and you know toilet paper and stuff like that uh you know but when you're when you're really in a business like ours you know you're you're kind of selling desire and you're 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 inspiring people uh and and consumers you know consumers don't really know what's next they don't really know what they want until they see it you know no one uh, Interesting. You know, it's like uh, there's a famous quote from Henry Ford that he that he said, if I asked my customers what they wanted, they would have told me a faster horse. Right. And <laughs> and uh, uh, and and so so we, we are, a, a, you know, kind of a, a vision led company. And um, and so so, you know, the 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 idea, the central idea that we built around is that uh, we, we are a product leadership company. That is what we sell. And we've architected a company. Uh, around pro uh, around product leadership and um, everything that we do and everyone that works here has to have a, a framework and a lens that says how am I contributing to kind of elevating amplifying and rendering the product more valuable mm -hmm. so um, people ask me you know they say oh you're building these big stores and you know, you know tell me why is that mm -hmm. well well, we have a big product assortment and the, the, the galleries are designed to amplify and render the product more valuable, right? Um, our delivery service and, you know, customer experience is designed to amplify and render the product more valuable. Our interior design services are, are, are you know, they're, they're, yeah, they're architected to amplify and render the product more valuable. And so everything starts with that core and, and everything is designed to amplify that core and, and render it more valuable. Uh, and, and it's, and it's hard by the way, when you, when 
in most of the time in the world when you're 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 additive you're, you're generally dilutive right you try to mm. do more you're actually doing less um and uh this this you know the simplicity of knowing what's really important right like all of a sudden when when functions and um capabilities and systems become more important than the core or they become uh, they, they become mm. equal to in efforts and focus. What, what can happen is you can, you can actually shrink the core. It becomes less relevant. You know, there becomes a, a battle and a competition for resources, a battle and a competition for time. And, uh, and it, then you, you, want, you wind up diluting the focus on what is the one reason people, you know, that you exist. So, you know, I, I kind of relate it to you know, we, we all go to restaurants, right? So this, everybody can relate to this. Um, you know, it, it, doesn't, it doesn't matter as much how nice th the waiter or waitress is. It doesn't matter as much, uh, you know, how beautifully designed the restaurant is if the food sucks, right? And so, you know, if, if, the, if the food sucks, you just don't go back. And, and, uh, uh, and I think that a lot of times I, I observe businesses where they, they, they make things important that other people are making important. And, you know, humans, I always say that, you know, we, um, you know, we're creatures of habit. Uh, you know, from the time we're born, we're taught to conform. We're taught to conform to other people's thinking, to conventional wisdom. You know, we're taught to, you know, look at the stars, not reach for the stars. So we, we tend to be comfortable looking for best practices as opposed to next practices and you know people start talking about you've got to be a digital first company and then everybody starts focusing on that or you know if you went back you know to the early 2000s you know the, the re-engineering re-engineering movement or um you know the you know this i you know I, like i'm old enough that i've seen all these different phases and and generally, you know, you know, you, you wind up with consultants, you know, kind of coining something and marketing it to the world. And then everybody starts follow, following it and and they lose focus on what what is really at their core. What is the truth of that business? Uh, you know, what is the the bane of existence? And they start, you know, they start working on, you know, people start working on um, uh, on uh, working real hard on on. Uh, kind of the fringes of a business, you know, or the secondary tertiary yeah. um, pieces, and they don't work out in, in the right order. So, you know, I don't care how great you become with, you know, with the digital platform today. I don't care, you know, how much, you know, AI, you know, you know, AR, you know, or VR, you know, or virtual reality, your artificial intelligence and all that stuff you have. Um, if you don't understand the core of what what you're doing, if you take your focus off off that, you're just not going to win. You know, there's so many retailers today that have invested, you know, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, and and uh, forgot mm -hmm. forgot yeah. what what they're really serving the customer. You know, and so um, you know, a, a lot of our best work is, is done here. Uh, you know, with with uh, a pad of paper and a pencil or a whiteboard. Uh, and then, you know, we say, we say under our company, um, systems don't, you know, systems don't uh, simplify, they amplify. And, you know, people a lot of times think, well, the system's the answer, or this is the answer. And now, you know, humans are the answer. Humans conceptualize ideas, humans create visions, humans can translate a vision into a strategy. And what you need to do is you need to have that vision, you need to architect your strategy and then once you know what you're doing you can you can you can add, you can <clears throat> amplify it with systems right uh, but 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 you're not going to win with systems jeff mm -hmm. bezos didn't win and build amazon based on a system he he built it based on a vision uh and uh, exactly, and, and exactly. then he, yeah you know and so uh you know so so for us uh, you know, for, for us, everything, this ecosystem is about amplifying the core. It's about amplifying the product. So, yep. you know, no different than I say, you know, the, the interior design services amplifies the product. And the other thing, the other challenge we have is, you know, we, we were, we're trying to build, you know, the, what I, I think about is the first 
kind of f fully integrated um, uh, luxury home brand in the world, right? Mo you know, some of the ones that, you know, that are kind of luxury brands are kind of isolated product categories, you know, and, but no one's really has a fully integrated, uh, you know, you know, fully assorted an integrated brand, uh, you know, in, in, at the luxury as, uh, part of the market today. And if you think about, um, we, I refer to the luxury mountain. I refer to us having to climb the luxury mountain and that, that the luxury brands in the world, all the ones I know, they were all born at the top of the mountain, right? If you think about, you know, Hermes, Chanel, Louis Vuitton, you know, like Tiffany, uh, you know, Gucci, like, you know, Bulgari, and, you know, name any category, any, any kind of brand. They, they were always luxury brands. They were born at the top of the mountain. We, we, we were born at the bottom of the mountain. In fact, we were born underground. We were almost dead, right? So we had to, you know, dig ourselves out of a grave. And then we were trying to make an ascent up a mountain that no one's ever made. You know, and we like to say, you know, if you, if you, you know, if you weren't born into royalty, you have to earn it, right? And so, uh, you know, so the people at the top of the mountain, they don't really want you to make that climb, right? Mm. They, they, you're, you're not from the neighborhood. You're not invited to their <laughs> parties, right? You're not invited to their parties. So you have to do work that is so extraordinary that you create a forced reconsideration of your brand. You force people to see you differently. You force people to respect you, right? And and respect is the most important aspect of it, right? And and you know we say we want to build one of the most admired brands in the world. And and you know and 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 what do you have to do to be admired? Well, you have to be respected. You just can't you know can't get past that. So the the pieces of the ecosystem, many of them are designed to create a forced reconsideration of our brand to to respect us it's like a different way to communicate um uh in this world we you know we don't have a marketing department we have a truth group because we we say it's not what we say it's what we do that defines us right we we don't have instagram we don't have twitter we don't have pinterest right you know because uh, honestly we don't like to spend a lot of time talking about ourselves we spend our time working on our vision and uh and so yet even though we we don't have instagram we don't have twitter we don't tweet and we don't pin anything we're the most instagram <laughs> we're the most instagram brand of our kind in the world we're the most tweeted brand of our kind in the world and we're the most pinned brand of our kind in the world because we focus on doing extraordinary and remarkable work and what i've learned in my career you can monetize extraordinary and remarkable it's very hard to monetize ordinary and unremarkable right so so these pieces of the ecosystem what you know talk about the ecosystem is our products places services and spaces are these, so are these products, are, excuse me gary are these the four pillars that you're getting yeah 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 okay. products places services and spaces and so yeah. the products are the things that people can see today you know they're <clears throat> rh interiors rh uh, contemporary which is coming this fall rh modern rh baby and child teen um, RH beach house, RH ski house, RH uh, um, outdoor, and so on and so forth, right? And soon to come, RH color, RH, uh, uh, RH couture upholstery, RH bespoke furniture. We have many things in the pipeline, right? The, that's the, 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 the product uh, piece of it. Uh, the, the places um, will, are, are galleries, our guest houses, our restaurants, and our residences, right? And so those are our places. And all of those places are designed to kind of amplify, you know, and render the product more valuable or amplify and render the brand more valuable, right? How do they see us? Do each of those things, you know, do, do, they, do they actually render us more or less valuable? And so to, to do that, you know, and to kind of to, to earn the respect, to keep climbing up that mountain where, um, the air gets thin and the odds get slim, right? You have to do work that is so extraordinary and so remarkable. So people ask me, let's, let's just take some of the things that, you know, people have seen, uh, you know, hopefully maybe some of the students have seen, you know, our new galleries. So we've got about 20 of them now, 24 of them around the United States. Um, uh, and you may have seen and experienced, uh, you know, our restaurants, but nobody's seen a guest house yet. Right. And, and so, it's been written up in the press because it came out, you know, in the real estate kind of uh, 
uh, kind of uh, news news uh, 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 kind of papers that that uh, that we were opening a hotel in New York because we had to file a building permits and stuff like that. Uh, and so so people ask me, you know, people have like heard about it and been out been, you know been out there for a few years. We've been working on it a long time. In fact, you know, it's a funny thing. People ask me how long you've been working on the guest house, and I say I don't know about thirty years. You know, because that's about how long I've been traveling and looking at, you know, at places and asking myself, well, why is, why hasn't anybody done this? Why has anybody done that? And so on and so forth. So, uh, but, but, but uh, pe- people say to me, oh, you know, I hear you're opening a hotel in New York. And I say, no. And they go, well, well what are you doing? And I say, we're, we're, you know, opening a guest house. And then they say, well, what's that? And I say, well, we're trying to, uh, you know, we're, we're trying to create a new market, you know, reconceptualize hospitality and create a new market. Uh, for privacy and luxury, and and why privacy? Uh, because privacy privacy is the one thing everybody is given away with social media, and it's the one thing that the internet has taken away. Because anybody can look up anybody today, and we're we're a lot less private. We're a lot more exposed, uh, and and uh, and so 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 we believe privacy is going to be a, a big market. There's going to be there's going to be a, an opportunity to to monetize that market. So we say we're going to you know yeah create a, an entirely new market for privacy and luxury. And then people go, generally the response I get is, oh, I get it. It's going to be a showroom for your furniture. And I go, well, no. Well, why would we do that? We have a 90,000 square foot showroom 20 steps away, you know, right around, right on the corner in New York. And the first guest house is 20 steps from, from our biggest gallery. And, and then, I say the, then I say the one thing that kind of twists their head around. Right. And this is where you have the opportunity to create kind of the the opportunity to people see you differently. I say, I say, in fact, it's not going to have any of our furniture. And then they look at me with like a blank stare and they go, <laughs> well, whose furniture is it going to have? And, and I say, well, it's it's not going to have any furniture. You know, the the architecture and the design is it's a fully integrated experience where the, the architecture is the furniture going to be something it's going to be something nobody has ever seen um and and that and 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 i believe now after we've worked on it for so long you know and and thought so deeply that that i i do believe it it in its own way it is it is really unique in this world and i think it's 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 on many levels extraordinary and kind of remarkable and i think it's going to have a chance to break through the clutter and and force the people at the top of the mountain force those you know luxury customers mm. you know uh, the people who 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 you know uh, uh, the consumers at that level to tip their hat and respect to to force the you know our goal was to the legends of hospitality uh, Ian Schrager Inushka Hempel who is the mm. queen of the boutique hotels Ian Schrager who you know was what you know call him the king you know in the U S Inushka did really the first one in 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 uh, in London before Ian. And, mm. uh, you know, or, or Horst Schulze, who won the Malcolm Baldrige right. Award at the, at the Four Seasons, uh, you know, is it, uh, excuse me, at the, the, the uh, Rich Carlton, Isadora Sharp, who was the founder of the Four Seasons, uh, uh, you know, uh, you know um, I'm forgetting the gentleman's name, who's, you know, the founder of the, um, the Almond Resorts, but, but force those people to tip their hat, right? And I think, I think we have a chance. I think we've done something that unique. So, so the guest house is designed to, elevate and amplify the arts brand to see people to have people see us as thought leaders taste makers and place makers right mm. and 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 then see the brand differently respect the brand by actually doing something in the world of design and spaces that is that that nobody could have predicted right yeah. uh and you know it has to be that original of an idea and and then uh, you know, our residences, uh, we, we believe there's an opportunity. I think if you just go on Zillow or Redfin and you look at, start looking at homes and, you know, at whatever price category, there's, there's a lack of great architecture and there's a lack of great interior design or even landscape architecture. And that's what we do, right? We, at our core, we, 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 are, we, we are great at product. And then we, we are very good at amplifying that product through architecture uh, interior design and landscape architecture. So we believe we can actually sell fully furnished homes, you know, fully designed and integrated homes. And those will be RH residences. 
uh, and and uh, um, you know, and so yeah, so so yes. that uh, that sure. that we we think will be a big opportunity for us. And then then the services is kind of the interior design. We we believe we have an opportunity to get into the architectural services business, landscape architecture service businesses, and lastly the spaces is is plane and yacht design and charter. So we we um, just built from the ground up a brand new Gulfstream G650, which is arguably one of the best planes in the world. And we, if you ask Gulfstream, <laughs> you know, they would tell you that we probably built the most innovative and, and uh, uh, beautiful uh, G650 in the world. And we're remodeling the G550, the plane that you were on, uh, that was formerly <laughs> Ralph Lauren's plane, yeah. uh, and to, to match to match the, the G550. And they'll be RH1 and RH2. Uh, and they'll be on our website and you can charter them or, you know, you can also just admire them. And if you were someone who was at the top of the luxury mountain and you were, you're, you bought it, you're buying a plane and you want someone to help you design it, we can help you design your plane. And then we also have RH3, which is a luxury yacht that will be debuting uh, this fall. Uh, and, and, and that uh, will also reflect our brand ethos and our, you know, you know, uh, you know design sensibility. So we'll have RH1, RH2 and RH3. Uh, on the website, you know, we 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 have about 40 million unique visitors to our uh, to our website today. We we anticipate that number once we go global will more than double. Uh, you know, so people will be able to kind of see, you know, our our planes. They'll be able to see our yacht. Uh, you know, we may have a, another yacht that we're, we'll design from scratch and build. And uh, but but they'll see us, you know, in a way uh, in a, in a different way that they'll see any other home brand. And 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 we have to do things, you know, like why, you know, why planes and yachts? Well, the people at the top of the luxury mountain have planes and yachts. And uh, <laughs> and that's, you know, and so if you design the most beautiful, well-designed, you know, planes and yachts in the world, um, you're going to force them to tip their hat and see you differently. Well, Gary, yeah. Once again, I'm blown away. <laughs> I'm blown away the first time you laid a lot of this out. Um, and, you know, I mean tell the I'm going to tell the audience you, you think this is audacious well it is I mean it's fascinating the way you have uh, laid out your philosophy on these things and there's some obviously counterintuitive uh, ideas of yours that ju you just made very clear and simple um, so you know back to the audience you it is it's, it's audacious on one level, uh, on the level of what Gary was talking about, that that we tend to follow best practices and all that other stuff, and we don't understand that uh, technology and all these new, you know, razzle dazzle uh, ideas and systems and so forth and so on, are merely tools. So those are very important things for you guys to remember, and. Uh, I just want to give our audience uh, my personal description of you, Gary, uh, for them to understand why and how I believe you can indeed create and build such an incredible vision. I wrote uh, wrote last year in an article. Uh, <laughs> so Friedman is unique and complex, a philosopher, <laughs> an energizer bunny, a stream of conscious, brilliant visionary a bit nutty and unstoppable until he hits a wall traveling at the speed of light, which is rarely. So, and I, I mean that, I meant, meant every word of it. I think you're an unusual person in the right, in the, in the positive way. And uh, I think what uh, everybody can learn from you are all of the major things you were just talking about. So I don't know, you've got this $100 million uh, investment in, in Colorado. Um, I think you went through most of the things in describing, you know, your four pillars and how you are building this lifestyle out. But if you want to comment on that, uh, you know, is there some things in there that uh, you think we should cover? Yeah, yeah. And I think you people, well, you can say like, why Aspen, right? And, uh, yeah. um, you know, not, not because, you know, I love to ski. I'm actually, you know, I, I could barely ski. Um, but, uh, you know, Aspen is, if you think about it, is one of those kind of global destinations where the wealthy and affluent visit and vacation. Um, there's there's over 70 billionaires that own homes in Aspen. 
There's people that travel internationally from all over the world in, in Aspen, not only to ski, but also in the summer months. Uh, you've got the Aspen Institute. You've got the Aspen Ideas Festival. You've got uh, the Aspen Jazz Festival. You've got the Aspen Polo Classic. You've got, uh, uh, you know, many, you know, the Aspen Food and Wine, which is a big international destination. And I, I had never really traveled to Aspen uh, until my significant other, Bella, you know, really wanted to ski, and we, we wound up going to Aspen, and uh, I was just shocked when I, I'd be on a chairlift, and I was kind of talking to a, you know, a 70-year-old guy from Spain who's, you know, flew in to ski with his family, and, and uh, you know, and I'm meeting people from different places in the world, from, you know, Sydney, Australia, from, uh, mm. you know, from the Middle East, uh, from Moscow, from, uh, you know, uh, Paris, from London, and so, uh, you know, it, it, it really hit me. And, and when I think about uh, exposing the world of RH um, to the world's most affluent, uh, uh, you know, and um, influential, yeah. you know, kind of clientele in a single walkable market, it, you know, it may not be a better place in the world. If, if we would have, like, we, you know, we're building... Uh, an RH gallery on the best corner in Aspen with a beautiful restaurant on the top that has views of Ajax Mountain, uh, you know, outdoor fireplaces, you can you know, reserve tables by your own fireplace and so on and so forth. Uh, we're, we're building uh, the second guest house uh, in Aspen uh, and it's at the historic Crystal Palace and, and, uh, um, uh, and it'll have our first RH bathhouse and spa. Uh, and it will also have our first, uh, you know, no, our second, we'll open in New York first, is you know, a, a new restaurant concept, new live fire restaurant concept that we think will be really exciting. Uh, mm -hmm. We'll have the uh, RH residences at the historic Boomerang mm -hmm. Lodge. And we took a block in Aspen in the old Boomerang Lodge and we're reconceptualizing it and building, you know, five luxury homes there. You know, four of them will be 5,200 square feet and one of them 9,000 square feet, which is the old lodge itself. Uh, we're building a 10,000 square foot on uh, home on Red Mountain that we think will be one of the most innovative homes on Red Mountain. It'll be the, the RH residence on Red Mountain that has views of the entire Independence Pass, Aspen, and, and up to Snowmass. Uh, and we're also building, uh, you know, uh, our first luxury apartments. Uh, and we've got a fun glamping concept that's going to be very cool. So what, uh, con what concept? Yeah, a glamping concept. We call it... Uh, uh, we call it the hideout. And so, you know, you'll, you know, you'll, you'll hear more about it later. Uh, and then we also have our, a luxury micro concept that we're working on. Um, and so we're, we're just working on a lot of things that are about design and spaces and, yeah. and, uh, you know, uh, and some of them with the luxury apartments will be furnished with our product. Uh, some of them will be about the absence of product, just no different than, you know, people tell me, are you going to put a lot of technology in your stores? And I say, um, you know, I, I don't know how much we need, you know, like we, we all walk around with these devices, right? And we've got our, you know, whether, you, you know, you, uh, you know, for me, I have, I, I'm an Apple guy. So I've, I've got an iPhone, I've got an iPad, I've got, you know, all this technology, you know, you know, I've got an iMac and, and, you know, we, we you know, sometimes we, I think we, we, we're looking for the absence of technology, you know, we're looking for humanity. <laughs> and and yeah. so, you know, our spaces are more about humanity, less about technology, because we live with technology. Uh, and I think that, uh, you know, we are social creatures by nature. So creating spaces, you know, creating inspiring spaces and extraordinary experiences that that in you know that inspire people uh, and 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 help them see the RH brand in a unique way, help them see us as thought leaders, place make, tastemakers and placemakers um, will force them, we believe, uh, will create a forced reconsideration and force them to tip their hat. And, and so As that's why Aspen, it's a walkable market. It's got the world comes to Aspen, the right people come to Aspen. And I think we can kind of, you know, make a dent in the universe in Aspen. Uh, and then, and then we, we oh, believe yeah, we got, yeah, Jerry, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Just, just yeah. Let me cut in here a minute. So what yep. will you, what will you, I mean, are you going to have the RH logo on, on, on the guest house, on the, uh, the spa, on the, you know, yep. the restaurant. So, okay. So that, that yep. is how yeah. consumers yep. will, okay, great. Okay. Yeah. It'll be, yeah. The RH bathhouse and spa, the RH guest house, you know, yeah. Okay. Speaking of you, you brought up, online or digital what percent of your business is done online if any 
Oh, yeah. Well, today we're, we're about, you know, 40 percent online. We used to be 50 percent online. I think we're a little higher than 40, probably you know, low to mid 40s. Uh, obviously, right now, I would say, you know, this year it's, it's higher. It's probably, you know, over 60. We, we don't really pay that much attention. We're, we're, we're truly channel agnostic. You know, mm-hmm. like, we, you know, we, we know that there is going to be a migration, uh, you know, online. And we've always known that. And we architected this company 20 years ago to be a multi-channel platform, right? And okay. to be channel agnostic. So we, we don't we don't have independent teams that are competing with each other. You know, I think the thing, oh, I read your article on on uh, Saks Fifth Avenue. You were so <laughs> spot on. It is it is maybe the worst idea ever, you know? <laughs> but, but, yeah. But, but, yeah. but Gary, yeah, there's, Splitting the company into two companies, like a retail company and a and a and an online company. I like I mean, that. That one is just well. It, that's about as dumb as I've he, seen. He, he's, but, he, he is preparing for a real estate move. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah 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 yeah. yeah no, but but it's it's just a it's a classic. Yeah. Um, but but uh, but anyway, we we're, we're just you know channel agnostic and and uh, you know so we we have the reason our business used it used to be fifty percent um, online and the reason it was always was because we sized the assortment to the potential of the market, not to the size of the store. So we had these smaller mm. legacy stores that were about you know six to 7,000 feet of selling. Mm. And we, we built an assortment that's really, probably you'd need, uh, you know, you probably need 100 or 200, you need about 200,000 square feet to show our assortment today. And, and we, we just don't think that, I, I don't yet, I can't conceptualize a 200,000 square foot store experience, gallery experience, whatever you want to call it, yet that I think um, would, you know, would be intimate. We're, we're working on an idea called the RH compound, which is a series of buildings and a compound around RH where we're, you know, trying to kind of um, isolate and focus individual business and categories. And we'll, we'll probably test one or two of those. And that, that might get close to 100,000 square feet. Um, mm. uh, but but, but you re- we probably need 200, 300,000 square feet to show the whole assortment. So what we did very early on is we were the first retailer in America to put an iPad in the hand of every one of our associates. And why mm. did we do that? Not just to be, you know, try to be cool and have, you know, fancy technology. It's because we put we put the entire assortment in the palm of each of our associates' hands and they could sell from the assortment, the entire assortment, not mm. just from the store assortment. And we didn't care who got credit for the sale, right? And so you know, so 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 to us, it's it's not it's not about the channels; it is about the product and the consumer experience. Yeah, in every it. channel, right? That's how we think about it. Yeah, it surprised me a little that that fifty, sixty percent of your business is done online because of the the size of of the, the furniture and you know the uh, the, the shipping of, of of what you sell. Uh, would yeah, we have to ship it anyway, right? So we we oh, don't, yeah, you know, yeah. they, you can't, you know, one's walking out of a store with a couch. In fact, well, that's in fact, true. Robin, that's true. yeah, you know, in fact, Robin, <laughs> um, uh, really, uh, basically, a hundred percent of our business is direct to customer. We okay. we don't have yeah. any cash and carry in our stores. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so okay, it's really yeah, a, yeah, it makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. But, yeah. But, but but now Wayfair uh, is all online. They don't, or are they opening stores? I don't think they're opening stores. They, they tried. They they tried a store. Yeah, they they had a store yeah. in uh, Natick uh, Natick Shopping Center outside of Boston, and uh, um, you know, and then and they they just recently closed it, and and then they yeah. said they're gonna you know try other stores. I th- I think I think all the online platforms will eventually have stores. Yeah, I do too. I I, I do too. Yeah. Particularly the good the ones that uh, that stick and don't you know. Yeah. So okay, what about your global plan? Yeah, that's that's really one of the things we're most excited about right now. Um, you know, because we we believe we've look, we're we're not done by any means. Uh, you know, making this brand better. We're, we're we're at such the early stages. I you know, I've never been more excited about our ideas. I've never been more excited about the work and and the journey ahead of us. Um, uh, you know, but uh, but I think that that uh, we we have somewhat proven the brand in North America. Right. We 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 now are kind of the largest kind of high end brand of our kind. We are by far the most profitable brand of our kind. We just r- reported, you know, twenty one point eight percent operating margins. The next closest person is about 15. So we're 50 percent 
uh, more 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 productive and more profitable than the next best. And I think by next year we might be 100% more profitable than the next best competitor. Um, and so the brand is, is, as I say, as a model, right? As a brand and a business model is kind of proven. We have 53% return on invested capital, right? So we're super rare as mm. far as the, the, the returns that we generate. Um, you know, higher return on capital than I think Apple. So, wow. so, uh, wow. uh, so, so taking, if you just do the math, right? If you just do the math of, of kind of the great kind of luxury brands, what is their global penetration? Um, LVMH, uh, you know, Kirin, Hermes, uh, uh, Chanel, you know, so on and so forth are generally about 25% of their business is in, in the United States, kind of North America, right? 75% of their business is in the rest of the world. And by the way, that's the demographic profile. Mm. That's, you know, that's, if you looked at that, that consumer and say, where do they live? Where's the wealth distributed? It's about 25% in North America, uh, you know, in, in the United States. So, um, so we believe we, you know, it's a clear line of sight that we could be a five to six billion dollar brand in North America today. We can see okay. that by just transforming our real estate. So then, if you extrapolate that, extrapolate that that math and logic around the world, it says we we should be able to be a, a 20 to 25 billion dollar global brand, right? And that's without, that's without the guest houses, you know, becoming something, you know, uh, you know, uh, you know, a viable, you know, business that adds to it. It's without, without residences, without other parts of the ecosystem, which residences we think is a, a huge idea. I, I say to the team a lot, we're really only in the 10% of the market, you know, because the, the, the math at the high end of the market is that people spend about 10% of their total home cost on the furniture and home furnishings. So if you someone buys a $10 million home, they spend about $1 million to furnish it. Wow. And, wow. and uh, you know, if they spend 5 million, you know, it's about 500,000 on average. It's a good, good rule of thumb. So I always say we're only in the 10% of the business. If we can sell the whole home, we're in the 100% of the market, you know, and, and we think we can do that. And, and, and so that becomes an even bigger amplifier. That's where yeah. we think, you know, this, this could be, this could be a, a, a 70 to $100 billion platform, wow. you know, so, globally. Yeah. yeah. So, so Gary, just as you kind of customize or localize uh, Napa, different than New York, based on the consumer and around the consumers around and, and what their cultures are like. So you, would you, when you go globally and would you follow that same kind of localization? Like, for example, might um, might an RH uh, gallery look different in in uh, Shanghai, you know, than it would in uh, Paris or whatever? I mean, so, so yeah, like, yeah. So, so the the um, I'd say that the product won't change. You know, someone asked me the other day. You know, you're you're opening in Paris. Are you gonna? Is your is your restaurant gonna be kind of a, you know, more of a you know, Parisian influenced restaurant. I go, well, no, why would we do that? They, they have Parisian restaurants all, all through Paris, right? So, um, you know, we're, we're going to bring our brand to the world because I think the world is getting smaller, not, not bigger. Of course. Uh, yeah. You know, that the internet and, and, you know, these, these social platforms and, uh, you know, you know, have connected all of us as, as, as will, are, are quickly creating kind of a single view of what is best. Um, and I think that the whole world wants what is best, what is, wh whether it's clothing or watches or cars or, you know, like, you know, look at Tesla's success in China right out of the gate. And, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, so, you know, so, so we, we think that the RH brand, um, you know, we're, we're going to take it around the world in its authentic form, right? And we're not going to try to customize the product or the food or anything, right? And we, but we will uh, architecturally and experientially, uh, we will um, customize in some ways those experiences to those local markets. Like clearly in Napa, we're not going to build a big gallery, right? But, but Napa is the food and wine capital of North yeah. America today and one of the food and wine capitals of the world. So what did we build in Napa? We didn't really build a big gallery. The gallery is, is secondary. It is about 
food and wine, art and design in that order. So you see a beautiful restaurant, you see this beautiful historic stone building that we created, uh, you know, a wine vault and an indoor outdoor wine experience. Uh, and you know an indoor outdoor restaurant these beautiful outdoor gardens and olive trees and fireplaces and then behind that we have you know i think 2200 square foot gallery it's like our smallest gallery but it's yeah. just a little expression of the brand because the wealthy and affluent visit and vacation in napa but they don't necessarily go furniture shopping you know when they're in napa right. and the mar- napa is not a big market but they can experience our brand you know, from a food and wine and art and design experience, and they can see us. Like, you know, our restaurants are designed based on our design ethos. Our, you know, everything that we do is, is you know, got a similar kind of view of how, you know, we, we believe the best design is a reflection of hu- human design. It's a study of uh, balance and symmetry and, and perfect proportions and the golden mean. And, um, you know, and we kind of abide by the rules of Vitruvius, right, where, where, you know, beauty exists in the, you know, in, in, in the, in the integrated design of the whole, right? And, um, and so we, we create these experiences that reflect our design ethos and communicate what we're about, right? And so we, we spend very little money on marketing, on, you know, advertising, on, you know, doing things like that. We, we try to focus our, our money on, on creating great experiences and great reflections of our brand and really, you know, it's, it is our truth, right? So we're just trying to put our truth out there and, and, uh, yeah, and, and let people experience it, you know? And so, um, that, that's yeah. the logic behind it. So, yeah. So what other brand or brands in any category, Gary, not just furniture, would you compare with your vision and why? I know you, uh, you talked to me about Ralph Lauren and there was some inspiration there. But, yeah. Uh, so who who would he be? Would that brand be one that? Uh, yeah. 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 Like well, well one we we learn from everybody, right? Yeah. There's there's things we we learn from everybody, and and Ralph Ralph has been a, a great inspiration in my life. I mean, I I grew up as a kid, you know, wanting to work for Ralph Lauren. I was saving my money, and you know, on the West Coast, I was working at the Gap, and I was going to move to New York, and you know, do whatever I could, start wherever I could to to work work for Ralph. And, you know, then Mickey Drexler joined the Gap and, you know, he had a great vision for the Gap. And he, I remember in a meeting, he held up a picture of Ralph Lauren in a denim jacket. And he was saying, see, we ought to sell denim jackets. Ralph Lauren sells denim jackets. And I thought like, hey, I like this guy. Maybe I don't have to move to New York. Okay? Maybe I could work for, for Mickey. And Mickey was a great, great mentor of mine, great, yeah. great impact yeah. on, on my career. But I've, you know, I studied Ralph my whole life. I mean, I, I really think he, he built one of the, the truly great brands in the world. Um, but the, if you said though, where, what, who do we study? And, and if you had, to, if you had to say what pieces, you know, are we architecting around? Um, I'd say it, it's really three companies. It's, it's Apple, LVMH and uh, Berkshire Hathaway and, and each ah. for a different reason. So Apple, because it is a singular brand, you know, with a fully integrated ecosystem. Right. And and uh, uh, and that's really where the idea for the ecosystem came. Mm-hmm. Like I, I just as a consumer, I saw how Apple built this beautifully integrated ecosystem of products. And once you're in the ecosystem, you're kind of in like it's really hard you know, to like, buy a Samsung phone, phone if you've got you know, other Apple products. So I, I love this beautifully uh, integrated ecosystem, the ability to amplify around a single brand. Right. And then. LVMH, uh, you know, what, what we've studied and learned uh, there is that uh, this idea of, they, they've created really, I'd, I'd say, the, the greatest luxury platform in the world. So they, they really understand luxury and they understand the consumer. And, and the, 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 the big headline is Bernard Arnault's quote that, that only in luxury goods is it possible to make luxury margins. Right. Hmm. And I, I didn't come from luxury goods. I didn't come from luxury at all. Right. I, my, my dad died when I was five. My mom had bipolar schizophrenia. The most money my mom made in one year was five thousand dollars. You know, we used to wow. get evicted, you know, evicted, uh, you know, multiple times. And, uh, you know, we never lived in a home, but, you know, never, never owned furniture. So I would say I'm the least likely guy to, to be doing what I'm doing, right? You know, again, you know, never went to design school. Yeah. You know, so, so, but, but, but we, you know, what, what, what I'm, what I'm, I'd say I'm pretty good at it. I'm, I'm a good observer, 
and I'm, and I'm, and I'm, and I'm kind of a good student of the things that interest me. Uh, and I, and I like to study the best. So, so, you know, this, this idea when, you know, we're studying, you know, how does, how do the luxury brands, you know, make 20 to 30% operating margins and all the other brands and businesses, you know, make seven to 12. And you realize at the luxury end of the mar market, there's much more leverage. You actually, in some ways you're, it's, it's easier to make money you're, you're serving fewer people making more money. You know, you actually have less activity, uh, less work. Uh, and, uh, and if you can do it well, it's really hard to do well. That's why everybody doesn't do it. Uh, um, but uh, so we, we, we've studied that and we've learned a lot about, um, uh, about that from studying LVMH and, and Bernard Arnault's unique view. And, and at times we, we, we thought like, well, should we be the LVMH for the home? Should we actually acquire brands and build build a platform of brands you know and and but that to me it's 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 it probably doesn't play to my strength and 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 the team's strength here because we built this our, our core strength is in a very focused way around a singular brand uh and so so that's why we like apple from that sense you know this singular brand and and, and you, you a lot of times you think you need more to become bigger but not really. Apple, with a singular brand, became the most valuable company in the world, right? So, so yeah. we like that model. Now, yeah, look, I, you know, I mean, LVMH is, you know, Bernardo knows the second wealthiest man in the world, or you know, second or third, and I think will become the wealthiest man in the world because of the luxury platform he's built. So, you know, it's 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 an incredible platform, but but we we tend to, you know, Apple for the integrated singular brand ecosystem, LVMH for the luxury positioning and the luxury model. And then Berkshire Hathaway, you know, studying Warren Buffett and uh, uh, and and the way they invest, right? It, they they invest with a long term view. Correct. They don't, you know, they don't look for episodic moves in the market. You know, they look for kind of you know the best positioned brands and businesses, the best leadership teams, and then they invest with a real long term view. Um, and uh, uh, and and they have a real disciplined approach, thinking about return on invested capital, and right. so that's what we've extracted there. And I'd say, you know, look, if you wanted to add one more, clearly Ralph has influenced, you know, the the idea of integrating m multiple categories in a lifestyle way, and this, you know, just this singular identity um, that that has been massively inspiring. Yeah, you know, uh, first of all, I have, I have to ask how much time we have left because I do want to give the students an opportunity to ask yep. you questions. Uh, Shelley, what what's the time situation? Yeah. Well, we have to we have to ask Gary if he can answer a few questions from students. We do have some questions. I'll um, what, try whatever to you'd like. Limit them. Yep. Yeah. What, whatever you'd like. Yeah. yeah, Gary. I think you. You know, I told told my colleagues before you got on and the students actually. You know, I, I've been with you enough to know that, you know, I can ask you one question and you could go on and on and you included everything that I had questions for in your <laughs> monologue. And actually, you're so terrific that I think we could go on for another hour. Unfortunately, we've got, you know, we've got this hour. So, yeah. Yeah. yeah, I could talk about this. I could talk about this for as long as you want to talk about it. So uh. <laughs> I know. that's what I like about you. Anyway, Shelly, go yeah. ahead. And, you know. Yeah. Well, we'd love to know. Actually, one of the students had asked. I have a lot of student questions, but again, I'll keep them limited because we value your time. But one of the students actually wanted to know what you learned from your time at Gap and working for Mickey. They would love to know what your lessons learned and how that impacts your current decision making. Sure. Yeah. No, I, 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 I learned about simplicity. I learned about focus. Uh, I learned about uh, taste, style, and quality. Uh, and I learned about urgency. Uh, and anybody who's ever spent time with Mickey Drexler knows he's, he's nothing, you know, if, if not, uh, you know, focused and passionate and urgent. Mickey uh, has the ability to distill things down to to what is most important and what is you know you know and then can translate it into a a simple way to execute it with massive urgency. So like you don't really want to be in a race with Mickey because he'll he'll probably <laughs> outthink you 
and <laughs> and and out decide you and he'll you know by why well you know you know he'll he'll be way ahead of you and so um you know i i mean i learned so many things from him i mean what, what an incredible uh, you know, mentor he was for me and, and just model he was for me. So uh, I always tell him, I tell him to this day, you know, I'll talk to him and on the phone and he, you know, he'll, you know, he'll joke around. He said, oh no, the students become the mentor, you know, whatever. And, you know, and, and, uh, and, 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 you know, and, and I'll, I'll say, look, I, you know, I always thank him, I'll, you know, every Thanksgiving or, you know, holiday, I'll send him a note and, you know, tell him how grateful I am because I, I, I might never be where I am today if I didn't have that experience and that model to watch because it, it gave me a lot of confidence uh, because a lot of the things that he believed in, I believed in, uh, you know, and it, it uh, you know, it was a reinforcement of my beliefs and values. Uh, and it, it gave me a lot of confidence that at a very young age, and I tell him, I, you know, I might still be a regional manager for The Gap today, you know, you know be, and, and be, you know, like doing a great job there, but I, I gotta, you know, uh, you know it just, you know, got a, got a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of confidence and, um, and I learned so much kind of, uh, just watching him, you know, build at the time, really the, the largest and most successful apparel, apparel company in the world. Thank you. Yeah. We have another question from one of our students that is asking, you have a lot of artesians that make company products. Um, how do you manage them all and set a standard for them to follow? Sure. Well, one, um, you know, the, we, we built a, a different platform here. Uh, we, we call it a, an outside in platform, not an inside out platform from a design point of view. Uh, we, we used to have be, be a, a typical, what I'd say, more classic vertically integrated model where we had, you know, teams of designers here designing and then kind of putting that product out into the world. And what I realized when I, when I was watching uh, Apple uh, build their ecosystem, when um, I had a friend ask me, "Do you do you want to you know go to the the CES, you know, the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas?" And he says, "You know, it's all the technology in the world. You should go. It's really fun. I think you'll learn a lot." And I and I ask, "Is Apple there?" You know, and he goes, "Well, no. Apple's the only one that doesn't go." And I go, "Well, why don't they go?" And they said, "Well, they do their own conference, right? And they have their own attendees come to their conference." And and I noticed, uh, you know, as Apple built kind of the App Store and uh, you know this ecosystem, that that all the best all the best developers were developing for the Apple platform. And what Apple had was the best platform. Therefore, everybody wanted to design for that platform because it amplified their work and they could, you know, do the best financially. And, and all the other platforms died. If we, you think about it, Blackberry, you know, basically gone, you know, Nokia, Motorola, you know, I remember everybody, no, Motorola Razor was the best selling phone in the world, right? Now they're gone, they're bankrupt. Nokia was number two, gone. Uh, you know, BlackBerry gone. Uh, so, so this idea, I thought, you know, we're never going to get all the best designers here in Corte Madera, California. <laughs> you know, we're never going to have all the best ideas. Why limit ourselves to just our ideas? Uh, and so we we turned it upside down and we said, let's focus our energy on building the best platform in the world, and let's attract the best designers, artisans, and manufacturers. You know, to kind of want to design, develop, create, and manufacture for our platform because we rendered them more valuable. We amplified their work. And so that's what we do. We, we kind, of, kind of curate all these you know, kind of people and products and ideas and inspiration. And, and then we, we are at our core really good integrators, right? So we don't really design anything. You know, even though people will say, oh, that's the RH look, right? And, and we didn't necessarily design it. What we did is we integrated it, right? We integrated all these people, all these ideas. And, and to do that, you've got to be careful. You know, a lot of the best people, they're, they're their own, you know, they're, they're living their own truth. You know, they're doing their own thing. They're living where they want to live. They're doing what they love, you know. And, you know, and if you've got to make sure you don't have too much rigidity that you you don't create an opportunity to work with the very best people in the world. So I always say people, you know, I had a board member that joined the board at one point. He's no longer here. And, you know, the first, first board meeting said to me, you know, I was explaining our concept and our platform. And he said, do you have contracts with these people, with all these people? Do you have contracts with these people? And I go, no. I said, no, we don't have any contracts. I go, you know, he goes, why? And I said, well, you know, 
you know, contracts don't necessarily work. You know, if, if contracts worked, there wouldn't be a 55% divorce rate in this country. You know, and so um, I said, I said, we have relationships with all of these people. And we have very unique relationships with each one of them. And we create relationships that are benef mutually beneficial, right? And we, we don't want to work with people who don't want to work with us, you know, and, you know, and we, we don't want them to work with us, you know, if they don't love us and if we don't love them, right? So we, 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 everybody's unique. Everybody has their gift. And what we, we try to do is amplify their gift and integrate their gift on our platform. And so we're, you know, we, we, we try not to have too much corporate rigidity when it comes to building those relationships, you know, and, uh, you know, but we have very high standards and expectations around, you know, quality and execution and things like that. But, you know, everybody's got their own thing, what, what's really important to them. Some people want to make more money. Some people want to, you know, have, you know, more design freedom. Some people, like, I, I don't really care. Like, I, I just want their best ideas. <laughs> Thank you so much. That's such a yeah. great way to look at the business. Thank, Thank you, you for your time today. I know that we are over our time here, so I'm going to turn it back over to Ron, but thank you so much. The students really appreciated hearing from you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for having me. It's an honor. Well, Gary, Gary, <laughs> thank you, Gary. Again, again, it's been absolutely terrific, and you are a, a rock star, and uh, your, <laughs> business, your business is confirming that, and the brand is confirming that, and... Uh, uh, you were probably one of the best teachers I've run across, which um, may be another profession for you. <laughs> well, really. thank you. That's, thank you for all the kind words, Robin. And you know, thank you for it's, inviting me and, and your support. And I just, I'd say to the students, you know, just, uh, you know, it's, 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 there's no overnight successes. This is my, this week is my 20th year anniversary at RH. Uh, you know, it's, you know, it's 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 been a long and challenging road, but it's been an, a, a thrilling journey that I've I've learned so much in. And and I'd say, you know, to to everyone, just um, you know, find what you love, do what you love with people that you love. You know, it's it's never been about money to me. You know, don't don't work for money. I had all my friends tell me when I was when I was young, you know, what are you doing in retail? You'll never make any money in retail. You know, you're, you're only making this, isn't that like, you should be a stockbroker. You should do this. You should do that. And, you know, and I've, and I've, and I've done well financially, not because I ever focused on money because uh, my journey has been more about my truth and what I love and how I've invested my time in, in doing what I love with people that I love and, uh, uh, and building an organization that's very values and beliefs based. Uh, because we, we believe people will work for a dollar, but die for what they believe in. So I, you know, I just recommend that everybody like, just don't sell out, you know, find what you love, do what you love with people that you love and your life will be rewarded, uh, uh, you know, by following that path. Well, you know, at that, least mine has to be. That's so. the best closing lesson and message for you students to take with you. What, what Gary has just said, I second it and um so i want to also thank our partners in the whitman school of management at syracuse and thank our audience again for attending thank you very very much and gary it's great seeing you again always great gary. to see you robin thanks so much raj great to meet you and students thank you, gary. Uh, look, look forward talk. Look, yeah thank you and the students look forward to working with you you can send me a resume if you're interested <laughs> oh we're take care everyone. Right. <laughs> All right. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye-bye.